Well, good morning. What's the first thing that comes into your mind when you hear the word peace? Is it getting away from the noise and traffic and busyness to a beautiful, tranquil place surrounded by nature? Or is it just a few minutes in a relaxing bath without the children? <laughs> Maybe this is something that you long for, an end to war and peace throughout the world. Or just to be at peace with someone you've fallen out with. For a lot of people, it's peace of mind, feeling less anxious and more like this, free from worry and at peace with yourself somehow. Or maybe you just want to give peace a chance. Peace can be so many things. So what does Paul mean when he says that peace is part of the fruit of the Spirit? Well, I think he means all of these, except maybe the peas. God's Spirit is active in the world all the time, and God is constantly working through his Holy Spirit to show his love to the world in all sorts of ways. And one of those ways is through his peace. So that means that one way we can recognise God and connect with him is when we experience moments of peace or when we're working for peace. It's at those times that we're closely aligned with God's values and his nature. Because peace is an attribute of God. So when we see it, we can know that we're close to seeing God or feeling him in our hearts. That's often a good time to reach out to him in prayer, to thank him for that moment of peace to acknowledge his presence and come to him. That might be during the service here at church. The 9.30 service can be joyful and noisy, but here there's a peacefulness as we all still our hearts together and focus on God in the readings and the sermons and the songs and the communion, and we respond to him in our prayers. Peace is part of the fruits of the Spirit, so this peace that we feel in church is a sign of the presence of God. And that means it's also a glimpse of God's kingdom. God's kingdom that will one day fill the whole world. So when we respond to that peace and we allow it to enter our hearts, we're drawing something of God's kingdom into this world. And when we act it out, we're advancing his kingdom too, spreading it through the world to help bring on the time when it will be fully here. Revelation chapter 22 describes the main high street of the heavenly city at the heart of God's kingdom. On both sides of the street is a tree that bears fruit all year round. Obviously, no ordinary tree. It's a spiritual tree. And I think the fruit it bears is the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace and all the others growing bountifully along the main road of God's kingdom. So when we see that fruit growing here, it gives us a little glimpse of what's already there, but not fully revealed here. Meanwhile, Paul says we're like that tree, full of spiritual life and bearing fruit all year round, nourished by the Holy Spirit as we follow his lead. As we live a life in step with God, that fruit comes naturally. <clears throat> I think we all know that it's no good trying really, really hard to have peace or joy or any of those things. We can't keep it up. Our own willpower is not enough. It's only the Holy Spirit who can bring them to fruition in us. Our job is to keep close to God, remembering to focus on him, and talk to him about our day. Involve him in our life and ask for his guidance in all our decisions. When we follow God's guidance in our life, we can act in confidence that we're doing God's will. And that's a huge source of peace. The peace is a byproduct of our prayers for God's guidance. And gradually, the fruit of the Spirit will ripen in our behaviour and our character and gradually we'll become more like Jesus and more of the person God wants us to be 
And Paul describes that as an incredible freedom to be free from the pressure to be a good person, free to just focus on God, follow the impulses he gives us, and allow God to change us. In our reading, Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about the peace of God which transcends all understanding. That's because it's a peace that doesn't make sense. We can't understand it because from the outside there may be no reason to feel peaceful at all. And yet somehow we can focus on God and trust him for the outcome. A few years ago I heard a story about a peace that didn't make sense. A peace that was certainly beyond the understanding of a lot of people. It wasn't a warm, fuzzy peace. It was, it was hard won and it came at a price. We met a woman called Jo Berry. Her dad was an MP in Mrs Thatcher's government and in 1984 he was in Brighton at the Conservative Party conference when a bomb went off, planted by the IRA. Twelve people were injured and five people were killed, including Joe's dad, Sir Anthony Berry, MP for Enfield and Southgate. This was a tragedy on a national level for Britain and Northern Ireland, and of course on a personal level for Joe and her family. How could they respond to something like that? How would you respond? When we chatted to Joe about it several years later, she told us about her desperate need to meet the bomber. He was Pat McGee and he was in prison. She wanted to make him understand what he'd done to ordinary people and families. <coughs> but perhaps more importantly, she wanted to try and understand him for herself. At first he refused to see her, but she persevered. And then he was released under the Good Friday Agreement in 1999. Eventually he agreed to meet up and they began an extraordinary dialogue that was painful for both of them. Pat McGee saw Anthony Berry as the other, and, and the other Tory MPs as legitimate political targets. But to Joe, he was just her dad. As they talked over several meetings, they both began to see each other as a real person, with feelings and hopes, not just as the enemy. After a lot of talking and emotion and empathy, they reached a place of peace with each other. They've since gone on to give talks together all over the world to, and to work for peace not only in Northern Ireland but in places like Israel and Palestine, Rwanda, Lebanon, South Korea. Joe says about reconciliation that unbounded empathy is the biggest weapon we have to transform conflict. Now, I don't know whether um, Joe Berry or Pat McGee are practicing Christians, but it seems obvious to me that God is using them to bring peace to places of conflict. The Holy Spirit works throughout the world, not just through Christians. He redeems situations and he brings out his fruit everywhere. So when I see the work that they've done through building bridges for peace, I see that as fruit of God's Holy Spirit. This is the kind of painful, hard-won peace that comes after a time of struggle and suffering. Sometimes it's found in a marriage when two people come back together deciding to overcome their differences and re-accept each other. Peace is not always easy. People often point out that the fruit in this passage, in the passage in Galatians, where it describes the fruit of the Spirit, it's, it, the, the word that's used is singular. It's not nine separate fruits. It's one fruit. And that's because each one is part of the others. Peace is also made up of joy and love and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, self-control and gentleness. Those are the ingredients for peace. And speaking of hard-won peace, the ultimate peace is our peace with God. That's been bought at a price by Jesus. 
at the cost of his own life. Romans 5 talks about that, how Jesus died to bring us back to God even before we turned to him. He forgave us when we were not sorry. He loved us while we were working against him. Joe reached out to Pat McGee before he was sorry and wanted to understand him even while he was still technically a terrorist. Extending that kind of peace took huge empathy and commitment and Jo got a lot of criticism for it from her family. Some of them either wanted revenge or just nothing at all to do with the man. But Jo made the first step. And Romans says that's what Jesus did for us. He reached out to us for reconciliation and peace before we'd even stopped and looked for God. He died so that we could be at peace with God. That's how important our relationship with God is to Jesus, more important to him than his own life. Is your relationship with God that important to you, more important to you than your own life? So let's get practical. What can we do to deepen our relationship with God, to be more at peace with him and to experience his peace in our life? Well, our reading from Philippians 4 has some good suggestions. Paul mentions two women who seem to have fallen out, Euodia and Syntyche. And they were good Christian ladies, so I hope they weren't quite this bad, but they haven't been able to come to agreement on their own. So Paul asks the people close to them to step in and help. Someone needs to mediate, and maybe more than one person. When people can't agree, they often ask someone to negotiate for them. In business, it might be an agent or a consultant. In other cases, it could be a counsellor or a lawyer. But the principle is that sometimes we get into a position where we can't make peace on our own. We need someone to help who's got our best interests at heart. As Christians, we should not be afraid to ask for help in those sort of situations. We should always, and at the same time, we should all ourselves always be ready to be a peacemaker if someone needs it. One of my neighbors once asked me in for a cup of tea and she wanted to talk to me about her sister. They'd fallen out and she didn't know what to do. I felt at a bit of a loss, but she explained the situation to me and as she talked, I could see the cogs turning in her head and we prayed about it. I don't remember giving her any particular pearls of wisdom, but she did tell me a few weeks later that things had softened and she and her sister were starting to build bridges. Sometimes just having an objective listener can create enough of a shift to open the way for reconciliation. Do you need someone to do that for you? Don't be afraid to ask another Christian. Do you know people who can't agree? Don't be afraid to offer to listen and help. Freedom from anxiety is an important aspect of peace, isn't it? And the next few verses, four to seven, give us the secret to having peace of mind. Verse four says, rejoice at all times. Stephen talked last week about joy and how unlike happiness, it's not dependent on circumstances. Can we find something to rejoice about, whatever our situation? When I was younger, I read The Hiding Place by Corrie ten Boom. She and her sister, Betsy, were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp during the war for hiding Jews in their house in Holland. One day, they were moved to the worst hut in the camp, which was full of bedbugs. They were trying to rejoice, but Corrie found it too hard. Betsy prayed and actually thanked God for the bedbugs. And Corrie forced herself to say amen. Over the next few days, they discovered that because of the bedbugs, the guards hardly ever came into that one hut. That meant that they had more freedom. Freedom to share food with the other inmates. Freedom to pray together and generally care for each other 
in ways that had been far too dangerous in the other huts with their regular inspections. What faith to rejoice despite their situation. Paul contrasts this with anxiety. If you can rejoice about something, you're less likely to be anxious about it. And the way to do this, he says, is to turn your anxiety into prayers. In everything, present your request to God, he says. Don't let things go round and round in your head, causing anxiety, but instead, talk to God about them. Tell him what you need and thank him for the blessings that you can see. When we do that, Paul says, God's peace will fill our mind and our heart and keep us safe. That's the peace that's beyond understanding. Like the joy that transcends circumstances, this is a peace that enables us to rise above the anxieties of the day. And the reason for that is that it doesn't come from us. It's not a peace we find in ourselves through meditation or emptying our mind. It's a peace that comes from the faithfulness of God. We can have peace because we can trust God. So the process that Paul's describing is this, Paul's four-step plan for peace of mind. We start to feel worried about something. Maybe anxious thoughts are coming from all angles. So we direct those anxieties to God. We tell him what's worrying us. And then we tell him what we need. Paul gives three types of asking, prayer, petition, requests. That's quite a lot. God doesn't mind if we repeat ourselves. He doesn't mind if we're a bit incoherent. He just wants us to speak to him. He wants us to hear us talking about what's on our mind. And he wants us to ask him for the things we need. But included in the list is thanksgiving. Amidst all this, it's important to remember to find something to thank God for. We can think of the things that he's given us. That can be simply the weather, or someone who cares for us, or the way that God's helped us in the past. Thanking God reminds us of his faithfulness, and it helps us to trust him. And verse 7 says that when we do that, even though we can't understand why or how, the peace of God will fall around us and guard our heart and our mind. Because the peace comes from God, not from us. It's from God's faithful love for us and his Holy Spirit growing in us. And that's beyond anyone's comprehension. <coughs> and the final step to remaining in God's peace is to focus on the good things. Things that are true and lovely and admirable. That doesn't mean being escapist. But it's a reminder that there is a way out of negative thoughts. We don't need to get bogged down in a destructive cycle of anxiety. It's an antidote to getting cynical, which can so easily happen if we focus on the nasty side of things too much. Instead, we can look for what's pure and lovely in any situation. And then maybe we can work to make those things bigger. We can use those glimmers of hope to spot where redemption might come from. That's not about putting on rose-coloured spectacles. It's about looking with the eyes of faith to see where God's working. And the result, it says in verse 9, is that the God of peace will be with you. So peace is part of the fruit of the Spirit that grows in our life as we stay close to God and allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit. This spiritual fruit is God's new creation in us, ripening in our life as we become more like Jesus. <clears throat>